All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Trade Risk Live. I am back here with Felix Bertram. Felix, how the heck are you? Pretty well, pretty well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I've been uh, you know, taking everything in stride. It's been a busy, uh, busy time out there in markets, to say the least. And uh, yeah, I think all things... All things have been pretty good. Weather's getting warmer. Snow's melting over here in the cold northeast, and so uh, no, no complaints. Um, sure. Yeah. So, so you know, I think folks are pretty familiar with you and your background. We've done a few of these now. So uh, the last few months, Felix has been on the show, and uh, we started. Well, we started with you know really kind of looking at last month was just doing an overview of the back testing engines and the platforms, the pros and cons and features of you know, quantitative investing, what's required to actually, you know, do a fully rules-based trading system. That was last month's episode. Prior to that, we did a deep dive on Monte Carlo simulations. We had some cool visualizations uh, in Turing Trader on how you uh, really kind of get the most out of Monte Carlo simulations, to be frank, and, and you know, how to, how to make informed decisions. So that was two months ago. Uh, and today we're going to talk, uh, we're going we're gonna to get our hands dirty and we're going to look at some code and we are going to be looking at a simple, pretty simple uh, momentum trading strategy, one that's very easy to implement. So for folks here that are watching that are maybe not familiar with some of these tactical asset allocation strategies, these, these set periodicity rebalance momentum strategies, um, I think this will be a good, good kind of primer. And um, and we're going to walk through it and we're going to look at some results. So hopefully it's it's going to be informative all around. If you have questions, comments, throw them in the chat. We, we, we want to take them. We want to uh, see what your thoughts are and, and answer any questions. And Felix is uh, a master programmer. And I'm going to use this opportunity to pick his brain line by line when we look through some of this code here. So uh, by all means, if, if anybody's got questions as we move through, uh, feel free to drop it uh, in the chat. So... Um, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's all I've got, Felix. How have you been uh, dealing with all this uh, bank financial crisis? You changing your strategies? Doing anything different? You sleep, you know, you get you sleeping well at night, or what's, I, what's the story? I, I think I'm sleeping fairly well. Uh, honestly, with this whole banking stuff, it's still a mystery to me how we got there. Um, so I guess one of um, the, the real questions there is uh, how did they value the assets um, and how did they keep them with an inflated value on the books for over a year? <laughs> and so there, there's a lot of questions and ultimately this leads all back to the question, does um, tactical asset allocation add value? And I think it does because they, they should have sold those bonds a year ago and they didn't. Mm. I love it. I love it. There's the hook right there. That's what we're going to be talking about today is tactical asset allocation strategies. It's being dynamic. It's understanding the market environment and it's rebalancing when appropriate, right? Uh, and that's what Felix is talking about here, uh, particularly around the fixed income side. So yeah, awesome. I agree with you. Um, I haven't been doing a whole lot. I mean, I, I figured your response would have been, Evan, I don't really care. My strategies are just running. So you taught, you know, you, you, you gave more there than I thought it was. And I, I thought that was a setup to say, hey, this is why I build systems because I don't have to worry about all that stuff. Uh, but I know that's what you, you ultimately feel. <laughs> um, let's get into it. So, uh, right. like so yeah, I prepared a few slides just to get started uh, and get the, get the context of what we're doing. And uh, then we actually start uh, writing some code. And that's that will be that will be live, so that's unscripted. Beautiful. Let's do it. All right. So let me see. Get, um, get this on the screen here. Um, um, I can share my screen. That's great. Uh, easiest with two monitors. That's not happening today. Um, that's right. Um, under pressure. Under pressure. Everybody well, gets to uh, to witness well, it. Well, Felix brings that up. Um, yeah, again, leave any questions you have in the chat. Uh, this obviously is going to be recorded and uh, it would definitely be helpful to watch some of the prior live streams that Felix and I have done. So uh, particularly last week, uh, I'm sorry, last month, um, where we did our, our Turing Trader backtesting overview engine. Um, and so we're going to look at Turing Trader today. We're going to look at the code and we're going to look at that performance. So Felix, I got your slides up and I think you should be good to go. All right, cool. Well, we talked about the topic, uh, so I don't need to say anything about this one. Um, there's a little disclaimer here. So everything that we do here is for informational purposes only. This is not financial advice. 
And everything that we do here is basically hinged on past performance, which is not necessarily indicative of future results. Good. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about the Muscular Portfolios book real quick and why we're, we picked the Mama Bear uh, strategy for this um, exercise. And then we're going to do some live coding. Then we're going to do some back test and have a look at the results and uh, discuss the results a little bit. And then we will have um, some more room for questions. So um, let's jump right in. So Muscular Portfolios is a book by uh, Brian Livingston, and uh, he is actually local here in Seattle and a very nice and humble guy. And this is a fabulous book, and I recommend it to anybody to, to buy it, to borrow it, to look into it, because it honestly it contains everything you need to know about tactical investing. Um, and that's the true value of the book. And it's beautiful to look at. It's got beautiful pictures and uh, illustrations. And it's it's really a nice book. It also includes three easy-to-follow strategies. And, well, you should consider these a starting point. This is not necessarily what I um, would recommend you use, but it's, it's a good point to get started. Um, good. So what is the Mama Bear strategy? Um, it is very simple and concise, which is great for um, what we're trying to do today. It is easy to implement. It is easy to follow. So it only rebalances once a month. So it's not too painful if you really want to, to uh, bring this to life. And it does add value. We're going to discuss where to find that value and how exactly that is. And it is also representative for a wide range of strategies. So if you look at uh, other stuff from Gary Antonesi or um, uh, the Faber's IV portfolio, they, they all pretty much follow the same pattern. So um, therefore, uh, if you know this one, then you get a pretty good idea of how these other strategies work. And there's one thing that it is not. It is not the best performing strategy. And that is besides the point of what we're doing today. Today, it's really about figuring out how do we actually code this stuff and um, uh, how do you analyze this and get an idea of uh, what you might want to do next. Good. So let's start with um, what this strategy trades. And it trades equities. So uh, some large caps, some small cap developed markets and emerging markets. And it trades some hard assets, real estate, commodities, and gold. And it trades some fixed in, uh, income, basically long-term versus short-term treasuries. And the rules for the strategy are very easy. So it only trades or only um, evaluates all the assets on the last day of each month. That is the last trading day. So that is not necessarily the last calendar day. And it calculates the five-month momentum and it picks the top three and then it allocates equal capital to each. And um, there's one additional little thing there. It's um, Livingston uh, skips rebalancing if there's less than 20% discrepancy between the desired allocation and the, um, and the current allocation. And that's it, that's really it. So um, what are we using to um, code this? Um, so everything I'm doing here is on Windows 64-bit. And that is actually a good idea because uh, for backtesting, you will need a lot of data. So with 32-bits, okay. probably not. A, you will run into some issues sooner or later. And for the tools, we're using uh, Turing Trader 16, which is um, a pre-release version um, that is hopefully going to be in full release uh, sometime next week. So right now we have uh, 1599 out there, and uh, it um, I'm working on the last finishing touches to get this out. And, and we're using Visual Studio Community Edition. So all these tools are free to use. So there's nothing that you need to buy to uh, reproduce this. And for data, well, we're using, um, you can do this with Yahoo Finance. I'm not using Yahoo Finance. I'm using Norgate data, which are a little better and a little faster. But um, you can run this with uh, just Yahoo Finance data. So right out of the box, nothing you need to buy. Good. So I guess uh, that gets us into the live backtest. And uh, let me, um, or the live coding. Why is there no coding? Oh, that, that was the other slide. OK, good. So let me um, let me bring this up. Um, so the the first part that we need to do here is we need um, or Turing Trader has two ways how it can run strategies. It can run them directly from a source code and compile them uh, on the fly in RAM, 
Um, today we're going to do this slightly differently. We're going to put this in a DLL. And the reason why we're doing that is because Visual Studio gives you so much more help if you're doing this in a DLL. It's so much more pleasant to code because then you have uh, all the proper syntax coloring and um, tool tips and all sorts of other little helpers that make this faster. So to write a DLL, the easiest way is to go into the books and pubs directory. And there's a solution file in here that you can open directly with Visual Studio. So um, this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to open into that. <clears throat> so while that's loading here, just to, you know, again, give folks a, a reminder here is that this code, so everything we're doing here is is fully available, public. So A, the, the, you know, the strategy rules are totally public. So you can duplicate this, replicate this, trade this yourself. Uh, the Turing Trader platforms open source, you can download it. And Visual Studio is free. You can use it. Everything here is duplicatable. There's no paywalls. There's no anything that we're looking at here. Um, and again, just to you know, reiterate here, before we start jumping into the lines of code here, for Livingston's Mama Bear portfolio, so that is the name of it, it is just for folks that are used to you know those trading strategies that are rotate or doing a bunch of trading every single day or looking at technical analysis. It's not doing any of that. So as Felix said, it's one time a month you get to come you, you come to your table you come to your computer and you say okay what went on this month what was the performance of all of these assets right that's the high level you know strategy or, or, or process here for this strategy what happened over the last again five months you're looking back five months but you, you come to the table at the end of the month right and you basically say rank these assets what was the best performing and i want to be in that what was the worst performing get me out of that Right. And so it's it's a very, again, easy to follow strategy that has some properties to it. We'll talk about performance later. Um, so, yeah, I just want to set the scene there uh, and, and add a little bit to what Felix already said. And looks like he's got Turing Trader up and uh, or Visual Studio is up. And we're about to jump into maybe the class file. All right. Well, so. Now we create a new uh, file here. So basically you right click and you say add new item. And you give it a name, and we can call it uh, live stream um, uh, Mama Bear. And we add this. And uh, now Visual Studio is going to create a dummy class for us. And um, here we already have a class. So we need to make that public because um, uh, Turing Trader only looks at public classes um, when um, uh, loading DLLs. And the base class for all of this has to be algorithm. And now, we need to make sure that we're using the V2 engine for this. So uh, this is what I just edited here. And now we already have a very simple um, algorithm that Turing Trader understands. It's not doing anything, but uh, still we have an algorithm. So we can give it a name. And so um, let's uh, say, oops. This is all C sharp, folks. C sharp. Good. So, and now, now we have something that, that should work. It's still not doing anything, but it should work. So let's let's see what happens. When we click this button here, it will compile. It will move the DLL into the folder where it belongs and um, to a trader will launch. And now when we look here in the um, showcase algorithms, we see living live stream Mama Bear. And when we click on that, we see the same name that I typed in here, Livingston Mama Bear, appear here. So this is working. Good. So first thing, we have at least a rudimentary uh, framework that we can work on. So now we can, uh, everything that Turing Trader executes uh, happens in this class. So, um, so we override uh, the run method. And um, the first two things that we need to think about are the start and end date for our backtest. So um, let's uh, define the start date and uh, call it, uh, And you see how Visual Studio helps you with uh, auto completion for all of these things. And so, what Felix has got going yeah. on here is the actual start date that this back test is going to begin its simulation on. So, in this case, Felix has put in January 1st, 2007. So, that is where we're going to start the simulation of this strategy. 
And as you can see, this is in, um, in ISO format. So it has a time as well here. So at 4 p.m. And the time zone is uh, New York. So this is just to make sure that we're basically starting it right after the close on January 1st, even though there was no close on that day. But um, we'll get to that a little later. And now we need an end date. And for that, we can say, hey, we just uh, use today. So um, this is the first part. And now the next thing that we need to do is we need to think about all the assets that we want to trade. And uh, the easiest way is to put these assets into a little list. Um, so um, create something like this. Uh, And now we can put in all the, the asset names that we have here. And um, let me, I, I have some notes here, so I don't memorize all of these things. But, Cheater. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> that's, that's where you hear the, the noise from. Uh, <laughs> all right, so. Uh, so yeah, these are, and so you can see, yeah. So basically Felix has got a, what he's called his universe, right? And these are his universe of ETFs. So in this particular strategy, these are the ETFs. These are the. This is the universe that this particular strategy trades. If you've got other trading strategies that are trading the entire S and P 500 individual stocks, then you would define a universe based on whatever you're looking for. But in this in this simulation, we're looking at Livingston's Mama Bear, and that's what it trades. And you can see, uh, yeah, the comments coming in. A, a blend of equities, hard assets, and fixed income is basically what this trading strategy could hold. Great. So, and now the most important part of um, any uh, tour and trader algorithm is the simulation loop. And this is what we're going to start here now. Um, and for those that are a little less familiar with uh, the syntax of C sharp, sim loop is a function that we're calling here and we're passing a function into it, which is everything that comes in here. And this is basically what we need to do for every single trading day. Um, so um, what do we need to do? We wanted to look at the momentum of these, and then we wanted to pick the ones with a, um, with a top-rated momentum. So let's uh, start here with the top three. And um, now we're using a feature called Link, that's Language Embedded Query. So basically, we're using a feature uh, where you can um, do a database query uh, from code or something that looks like a database query in code. And we start with universe, so we start with this list. And uh, now we say, hey, we want to order these uh, by descending momentum. And um, for each one, we get the ticker symbol. That's uh, what we receive from uh, this list. And we want to now calculate the momentum. So for that, we take the ticker symbol and load the data for that. So this is what we get here. We take the close and uh, we take um, today's close and we divide that um, by the um, close five months ago. Five months is um, 21 trading days per month. It look like this. And now we can write that back into a list. And this is really something that is that I enjoy a lot using link for coding uh, because it makes it so much easier than uh, um, calculating things, storing the momentum in some structure like an array or whatever, or a hash, and then uh, using a for loop to go through this. This is so much more concise. So um, I really recommend um, getting into the habit of writing code like this. So just to clarify again, though, the sim loop here, this is what's going to be, this is this is what's essentially run or calculated or computed on every single trading session. Is that right? Trading day? Every single trading day, yes. Every trading day. Okay. And so, so far, every single trading day, this strategy, as it's written here, lines 29 and 30, are going to take your assets and it is going to compute that five-month momentum as you can see there, line 29, and then it's going to order them by descending. So you're going to get the biggest on top. Is that correct? Yes. Biggest on top? Yeah. That's correct. And uh, well, the, I said it's top three. So far, it's not top three. So far, they're not only sorted. So let's take just three of these. So now it's actually the top three. Got it. So your top three list is going to in fact, hold the actual top three performing assets from the universe defined on line 19. And now we need to 
think about allocating some capital to it. So um, uh, let's do something like this. Um, and uh, this time we're using a data structure called a dictionary. And a dictionary is basically uh, is similar to an array, but you can index it not with an integer, but with a string. And we're going to use the ticker symbol to index here. Um, so that looks like this. And now for the, um, that is the index part. And now for the, um, uh, the, the capital that we're going to allocate, um, uh, that's, that comes here. Uh, so, um, so we're checking if um, the ticker is contained therein. And if it is, uh, then we use uh, Uh, then we use a third of uh, the capital, so that's this line. If it's not contained in that list, uh, we choose zero, so which basically means no capital at all. Got it. So you're looking at so right. So it's 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 now checking. It's it's looking at the entire universe. So it's technically going to look over the entire universe of of equities up there, or equities, hard assets, and fixed income. It's going to go through all we're of them. Looking at this whole list. Yep. And for every single ticker in that list, we're checking. Is this ticker actually part of the top three? Yep. And if it is, we allocate a third of the capital. Otherwise, we allocate zero to it. Got it. Yep, makes sense. And that's an easy way to to, to figure out capital to determine to determine capital. It's basically it's in percentages, right? So you're basically saying. 1.0 represents 100% of your capital, and you're dividing it by, in this case, three. Right, so each 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 equity or e not, not I keep saying equity, but each uh, each ETF would potentially take thirty three point three three percent. Right, is is that how it would work? Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Good. So now we, we are ready to trade. So this time we actually needed to use a loop, unfortunately. Um, how do we do this? Uh, let's. Let's do it like this. Uh, so when we iterate, so this loop is going to iterate through this dictionary. When we're iterating through a dictionary, we're going to get key value pairs. So we're going to get pairs of the ticker and its weight. And now we're loading the asset with, um, with that key, which is the ticker symbol. And we're going to allocate to that. And we're going to allocate to that the weight. There we go. And we're going to do that on the um, open of the next bar. And now we're actually going to trade these. So I love how you said. I love how you said that uh, this time we need to use a loop. Unfortunately, what is what? Is, so I got to just ask, like, what's the unfortunate part about using loops? Is it is it not as efficient of a process compared to? Well, that's, you know, that's the difference between imperative coding and functional coding. I prefer writing what I want to achieve. So I would rather have an expression that looks like this, where mm -hmm. we're directly allocating and instead of looping through something, mm -hmm. because we, we shouldn't know about uh, loops or anything like that. The code shouldn't look like that. Got it. But uh, th there's unfortunately no way around that. So we have that here. Good. So now the tra st uh, strategy is actually already trading. There's two problems with it. Um, for once, we're trading every day, and also it will not tell us the results. So that's not incredibly useful yet. So we need to do one more thing so that we can start looking at it. We need to chart the results. So unless other backtesting engines, Turin Trader does not create any default charts for you. So anything that you want to see on the screen, you need a code. Uh, and for that, we have the plotter object. So we uh, we use the plotter and we create a chart and we call this, uh, just give it the name. So that's going to be living some small more bear. So that's this name above here. And we're going to chart um, on the horizontal axis. We're going to have date. So we're using that. So here we have date. And now we can set the horizontal position. And so this here. And uh, now we can plot a value. And what we want to plot here is uh, net asset value. So 
they would have got the nested value. And you can see that I'm only typing 10% maybe of the letters there. Uh, this is all the auto completion that you get from Visual Studio. This is why this is so much more uh, rewarding and so much more efficient to code directly in Visual Studio than to do anything uh, external. So that's why I prefer coding DLLs. Good, so this should actually run. So let's see what happens. Oh, that's, this is great. So this is not helpful. I thought it would be not doing anything, but okay, good. So um, we have loaded this, we have the run button here. So let's click it and see what happens. And uh, it'll go, it's going to load some data from Norgate. So uh, let's, let's endure this. Um, well, we can actually kill this here. Uh, and, uh, and here we've got a result. So there's hey, there's an equity curve. There's an equity curve. It looks ugly. We're, we're going to get to that in a second. Um, so this is the so we we can now trade something and we can look at results. This is great. So um, great step. We're still not finished. So there's a few things that are missing in the strategy. So for for once we're trading every single day. So this is something that we did not want to do. Livingston said we want to trade only once a month. So. Let's uh, put a little if around there and say if the sim date, the, um, the current month, is uh, not the same as uh, the next sim date's month. And this is actually a feature in Turing Trader that makes this very easy that you know what the next date is going to be or tomorrow from the perspective of this loop is going to be. So if that's a different month, then uh, we're going to go in here, which basically means this if is going to trigger on the last trading day of the month. And there's one more thing that we want to do here. Um, we want to also plot it against the benchmark. So um, um, what type of benchmark would we want to use? Um, uh, let's see, this, do we have that? Yeah, we have that. Okay, so then that should probably work. Um, so, I, I, yeah, so it looks like you're trying to get the, yeah, 6040 is the benchmark. It's now on the line, so let's wait for this. And this is another one where, um, so this is going to work. This is a little better. So let's choose that. Okay. So I got a question though, Felix. So on the back to the line 29. So on the, the, the little magic if statement you put in there. So that's basically saying the sim date dot month. So that's going to return today's month or whatever value as you're looping through uh, or iterating through, you're getting the month that is current. And then it's saying does not equal the next sim date month. So next sim date would be the next day, right? The next trading simulation day. Next trading day. The next trading day. So got it. Okay. So even if there's a weekend in between and the month changes on the weekend, it's going to basically a trigger on the right day. Got it. Got it. And this is the first or the last day of the month? This would be the last this, day. This triggers on the last day of the month because yep. we're looking at the next sim date. Got it. Yep. So it's preempting it. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, line 48 was basically Felix just adding a benchmark in. So we can actually, when we look at our equity curve, we have something to compare it to. It's not just a naked equity curve that has no comparison. Good. So let's, let's run this and uh, let's see what happens now. And here we go. And now we see the benchmark here. And comparing strategies to benchmark is incredibly useful. And honestly, I would advise against developing anything without a benchmark. Because uh, as they say, the rising tide lifts all boats. You want to really see where is the strategy performing better or worse than the benchmark. And now there's, of course, a discussion to be had about what's the correct benchmark. And for a cross-asset strategy like this, I think the 6040 is probably a relatively fair benchmark to choose. It's certainly not the S&P 500. A better benchmark would
Felix, you still here? <laughs> um, maybe some internet difficulties here, some stream issues. So I don't know if it's me or if it's you, but it looks like Felix All is coming right. back. Can you hear me? All right, you're back. We lost you for a little bit. We're lost. Okay, my, my computer just crashed. So I'll be back in a second. It's rebooting. All right. I'll uh, I'll kill some time here. So Felix is a mastermind. So, you know, we're a little bit lost without him. And we lost, we just lost the uh, the desktop. But um, I think in terms of... So I'll, I should be back in just a second here. All right. So in terms of the benchmark... Uh, like Felix was saying, I think it's something that a lot of system developers wrestle with, with what is the appropriate benchmark. And I think I had a blog post. I'm sure you've written about this, Felix. Um, I think I have a blog post, but it was maybe as a draft that never got published. But yeah, it's tricky because like you say, you need something accurate, but you need something that actually represents what you're trying to beat. In most cases, um, it's a 6040 is is a pretty... Uh, is a pretty good benchmark because it does simulate or it does have a, a, an approximate amount of beta. Uh, and, it, and it also symbolizes some of the risk off rotation that these tactical asset allocation strategies, you know, try and try and essentially resemble or offer. Right. So um, when you compare something to like an S&P 500 oh or just a NASDAQ, I should, be, I should be back here. It's a lot more tricky. So while you add yourself, I'm going to put you back on here. I am going to drop you out and you should be good. All right. Can you hear me? You're good. We can see you. We can hear you. And then we'll just get those charts right. up. Yeah. All right. So give me a sec here. Um, yeah. So this is one of the nasty things with Windows 11 running on uh, Microsoft hardware that is occasionally not as stable as one would want. <laughs> and I've seen the same thing on two machines and uh, so it's not the hardware and it's not what I installed here or what I do so honestly there's not much on the machine I took the time over the weekend to reinstall Windows so this is it's a fresh install and it's yet doing this so I'm not exactly sure it, it happens preferably yep. during video streams so yeah, once you get that up, hey, it's a symptom of doing things live. That's okay. I should get a little uh, a little break music or or ad that plays when uh, things go down. The old breakage music. But uh, yeah, we're still there. All you right, go. I see All a stream right. coming up. Okay, good. So and we were just talking about benchmarks. So really, make sure that you have a benchmark uh, so that you understand what's going on. And. Um, so we're almost done um, with uh, coding here. So um, let's let's have a look at the code once more. There's one more thing that we didn't do so far. So Livingston said um, we only want to rebalance um, when there's a sufficient deviation between um, uh, the target weights and the current weight. So how do we do that? Um, we can do this um, uh, like this um, by... Uh, Looking at the maximum of, uh, oops, the current weights, and we can um, uh, calculate the delta to the current position. And so it should be something like this. So what what is the what is the logic of this statement? So it's basically saying what what's the situ what's like the the, the trading circumstance here? Um, well, the idea that behind is this is that you can save commissions uh, by not trading more uh, often than you should. I see. And, and this, I guess, in today's world, is not that relevant anymore. Where we're basically trading um, for a cent or something per se per share. In past times, there were also horrendous fees for or, um, the order itself as well, like another 50 bucks just to submit an order. And uh, some brokers still do things like that. So in those scenarios, this makes sense. Otherwise, it's only making very, very little difference. Got it. So, but what we can do is here, we can now see if it's more than 20%. So if, it, if the delta is more than this, then uh, we trade. So now this, this should be ready. 
and um, um, we can run it one more time and see uh, what happens. So let's take this away. So go here. Okay, fine. So now let's let's have a look at the reports here. So the first thing that we see here is the equity curve, and you can see well it's it's rising, so that's good. So we're making some money, and uh, the bottom part for those that are not familiar with it is. And a so-called underwater chart. So it charts the drawdown. So basically how much money we lost from the previous all-time high. And you can see that a 60-40 in the 2008 recession, for example, lost uh, up to 35% of its value. And you see here in the uh, 2008 recession, uh, Mama Bear was doing quite well. Then um, when you look at the other years here, then you see that it's slightly amplifying uh, volatility and drawdowns. And um, here you can see an effect where probably it's not fast enough to react to these fast uh, drawdowns and recoveries. So that's why it's getting um, uh, basically punished twice. So it, it takes a hit when, um, when the market goes down, then it rotates out of it, and then it doesn't recover when the market snapped back. So that's where this comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see this, this become a little bit of pattern here, probably doing the same thing. And um, you can see that it wasn't fast enough to get out of the 2020 recession and especially uh, missed uh, the rebound. But it did do something useful here. So um, in 2022, for at least half of the year, it was in something that um, held up better. But by now, basically, the market has caught up with it and it's seeing drawdowns that are similar to 60-40. So 60-40 by now is down to about 15% and uh, uh, this one is down about 17%. Well, I mean, there's a decent amount of zigging while the market zags, uh, at least the 60-40, if we're using that as our benchmark. I mean, I, I wonder, so I'm sure we can look at the correlations, I'm sure, in just a minute. And the other cool thing is we can look at what the assets were in, say, 2008 recession, where Livingston's Mama Bear portfolio did pretty well. We can actually go back to that time and see what the heck it was invested in, um, you know. To, yes. to, so, to well, let's, let's have a look at what we have in the report so far. So uh, we might need to add a little more. So, yes, we we, sh we could look at the assets that it held. Unfortunately, we didn't put that into the report yet. So there's another yep. few lines that we need to add. So let's let's first look at uh, what we have. So we have okay. metrics. So we uh, the um, Twin Trader calculated some metrics for us, and here we go. So. Uh, let's start from the top. So we see the full simulation range. So it's up to yesterday. So that's 16 years. Um, and uh, we see that uh, the return, the average return is a little higher than a 60-40, uh, while it has slightly more um, volatility. So about 0.8%, but that's close to nothing. Um, so, but you can see in the, um, we've seen in the equity chart that it amplifies volatility a little bit. That's probably about this. You can see that the maximum drawdown is reduced. Um, I'm not a big fan of the measure of maximum drawdown because it is a little misleading. Um, there's so many things that uh, can happen that just trading a day late or something that influence this big time. So it is not really a measure that you should rely on. So the same is true for the maximum flat days. You can see the sharp ratio did rise up a little bit, not a whole lot. And um, the the beta here is a little bit misleading because this beta is measured against the 6040. So, mm -hmm. um, so you we can see it's doing something different than a 6040 because the beta is only 63. Um, but it's not a beta against the S and P 500. We could do that as well by putting the S and P 500 as a benchmark. The yeah, ultra okay. index is a little better. That's mostly driven by the 2008 recession not because it's the average across the whole simulation range. So basically by not having as steep drawdowns in the 2008 recession, that's where this benefits from. And that's then also what goes into the also performance index. Got it. So I do not find these metrics especially useful, especially when developing strategies. Uh, focusing on these numbers is a bit misleading and makes you focus on the wrong targets. But let's go down the list and see what other things we might have that are a little better. So this is interesting. This is um, already 
maybe a little more insightful because it tells you a little more of the story, how, how the strategy is holding up against the benchmark. And you can see here in 2008, it was doing really well. In 2009, it was doing really, really well. A few years that it was doing great. And then you can see here, there's quite a few years that it um, was uh, trailing behind the benchmark, right? And, and you can see in 2021, it was doing very well. In 2022, it was holding up well. And this year, well, at least it's making money. So that's overall, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Now, the, um, the chart that I really enjoy the most is uh, the Monte Carlo analysis that takes a little bit. And here we can see something that is actually really interesting. Um, what we see here, and uh, for full detail, you should actually watch our um, other live stream, the, the one two months ago, I think, about Monte Carlo simulation that explain exactly what you can see here. But the important part is that for most investors that are wondering if they're going to reach a critical financial goal or not, and for most of investors, this is retirement, uh, the average returns are meaningless, which is the reason why I'm not that much of a fan of looking at um, the um, metrics and being too focused on these numbers. Um, if you're saving for retirement, much more relevant is the question of um, what is a pessimistic outcome? And therefore, look, looking at the fifth percentile is reasonably pessimistic, I would say. And here you can see that across the board, um, Mama Bear outperforms the 60-40. So if you are in a crunch and you want to make sure that even if things go bad, um, you're having the maximum that you can get, then this portfolio actually does add value. And what's important to notice is you can outperform at the fifth percentile, even though on average you're trailing every single year. <laughs> and here you can also see for the drawdowns, well, it doesn't do that much to reduce drawdowns, it does a little bit and a little faster recovery, but uh, this is mostly driven by the 2008 recession where it's looking better and uh, otherwise it's not adding as much as it could, I would say. Now, when we look at the rolling returns, then we see basically what I was saying before. Um, you can see here at the bottom uh, where we're looking at the tracking versus the benchmark that over the long term, basically from um, 2010 to um, 2020, so for 10 years straight, basically the portfolio was trailing against the 60-40 with, mm -hmm. with lips where it was looking better. And then here... It, um, until um, mid-22, it was um, making up a lot of that again. And even though it was trailing against its benchmark, you can see that um, in the Monte Carlo simulation at the fifth percentile, it is actually um, doing better. And that is something that is very important to understand and very important to keep in mind when playing around with these portfolios. That for most people, really, this bottom of the curve is what's interesting and what matters. Yeah, that's uh, that's very insightful. So, yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, just visually here, the fact that uh, looking at the top half of this pane, and again, I think watching our live stream two months ago would be very helpful to understand this chart. But I mean, it's, you know, to simplify it, it's good when the blue line is above the orange line, when it's above your benchmark, right, in terms of the top lower fifth percentile pane, right? Like, that's what you're looking at to be entirely above, essentially. Yes, yes. And yep. Just just to get an idea. So in order to have 90% confidence that you're going to break even based on the 16-year backtest, 60-40 uh, would uh, take something like close to seven years. Um, uh, the um, mama bear would take about five and a half. So that's already an improvement. And when you look at a 25-year investment at the fifth percentile, the 60-40 um, would give you something like 3% and Mama Bear would give you something like 4%. Uh, so that there is an upside. There is actually true value that we can see here. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's the fifth percentile. So that is the, it's, it's naturally the pessimistic 
outcome essentially that's what this 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 view is showing you and in kind of saying again it's not necessarily the worst case we don't want to say it's the worst case but it's it's a pretty high confidence that it's this is you know this is what you could expect after x period of time so yeah this is this is actually really yeah really insightful and i think you're right i think it does add some value here um at least some diversification value if not anything you know else now we wanted to learn a little more about the strategy, and I guess uh, we might find a little limiting that we start our back test in 2007, and also Evan was wondering about the uh, assets that it uh, held here. So let's see if we can do that. So we'll go back here. There's uh, some more stuff that we can add to the plotter. And one of the things uh, that we can add here is we can add the historical allocations. And uh, it's as simple as that. And we do that outside the loop because that's basically analyzing the trade log. We can actually also add the trade log. Maybe we want to do that. Uh, and uh, now we get um, two more things to look at. And so, yeah, if, you, if folks go to is it turingtrader.org felix they can find your documentation they can see so plotter is is you know a class an object that you can build on top of you can already utilize it's already built into turing trader so there's documentation um on how to you know pull up some of these things that felix is out of the box using and so yeah. here it is yeah the historical yeah. allegations also when you go to the uh, project and turntrader.org, you will also find a lot of sample code. So we have a lot of strategies coded up that you can look into and get ideas how to do things, how to code stuff or what to actually do with uh, such a strategy. And here you can see now the uh, historical allocations and you can see basically that it's trading on the last day of the uh, month or it's uh, evaluating on the last day of the month and uh, then uh, trading on the open of the, the next one. So um, we wanted to see what it was holding uh, throughout. Um... Yeah, 2008. So we can see, you know. Well, it's basically still holding equities here. It's uh, starting to add some, um, some treasuries here. And here it's in treasuries and, uh, and gold. M9, right? And here we get uh, treasuries and gold and real estate. Real estate in 2008 seems like a, an odd choice, but it's only 30%. So, hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. So even during September and October, kind of the worst of 2008, it was still in. So SHV had a little, you know, so a little fixed income there. Very, very defensive. Um, gold. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, plus some large cap stocks. So yeah, it kept those. So yeah, it did keep large cap, which definitely got hit. But like you say, I mean, it was thirty three percent versus you know the full brunt. So okay. Yeah, did very well during that recession for sure. Good. So, and we have this for for the whole simulation, uh, and we also have a trade lock. So we basically can see um, the assumptions. For every single trade right which symbol was traded when it was traded what the target was how many uh, was actually moved around and um, and um, then the fill prices and how much um, friction we assumed so how much fees and commissions we assumed here and you can see that um, it is trading also rather small positions but only if there's a big one that accompanies them cool right. so, yep so it does not trade every month. And well, that was probably easier to see here that there's a month missing. So that's this rule that we added there with the 20%, for example, didn't trade here in uh, November and December, didn't trade in February here, right? There's, there's a bunch of months missing. So that is that. Uh, now, there's still something that we would wish we could do. And we would like to um, back test a little further. So from, uh, 2007, that's really not a whole lot. So let's let's see if we can do some more here. So I'm not now um, replacing these um, um, with uh, something like this. And what this is, is um, these are um, symbols that are provided by the backtesting engine. Uh, 
that include backfills. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So instead of just uh, trading um, uh, the ETF itself, we're also finding proxies um, to put in there um, that uh, resemble the ETF in kind, but reach further back. So when we look at this, for example, um, then this was only this ETF was only um, introduced in September um, 2010, but we have a backfill until 1990. This one we have to 1994. Uh, 2005 is not a whole lot. So uh, for emerging markets, there's not much we can do. Uh, we have this to 2004. So um, 2002. Um, so 2004, I guess, is at least something that we can easily do. Gotcha. So that's the, the, the furthest back backfill, or I'm sorry, the least, the instrument with the most limited amount of history is 2004. And therefore that's as far as we can go back. Is that right? Uh, actually, this is March, 2005. So, uh, cool. and this, this is something that I'm, that I keep working on finding backfills to, so that we can run these simulations and reach further back. But uh, the problem is always, what do we um, use as a proxy? And you will find that also mutual funds uh, for a lot of these products did not reach far enough back. And so I, I'm still working on finding better backfills. But when you look at this one back to 1990 instead of 2010, that's a huge difference. And uh, sure. And I, for most of the stuff that I'm actually trading, I have backfills that reach further back, um, but uh, not for everything that's used for Mama Bear. So, well, at least we were able to squeeze a few more years out of it. And you see that the shape here has changed a little bit. Uh, that is because we've backfilled one of the um, assets there that was missing. Mm -hmm. Overall, it looks uh, pretty much the same. Very cool. So that means so Turing Trader has a has a library of sorts, right? Where it's tracking, it's 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 got a, a lookup of ETFs, right? Where it, it it is essentially has the backfill data associated with those specific ETFs. Is that right? Yes, and we're we're constantly working on improving that and um, expanding that, those backfills to reach further back. And one of the things that you might find here, for example, for these, uh, um, well, let's replace this with. Um, this one, right? Yeah. So if we use this one, for example, which is basically the same in kind, then we have a backfill till 1970, for example, for the for most of the treasuries, we have that, yeah. which is something that we worked on when we uh, developed our um, managed bond strategy. And we really wanted to see how these um, assets behaved uh, in the 70s when uh, the Fed last aggressively hiked interest rates. Yeah, I mean, the goal, obviously, well, I don't want to say it's obvious, but the goal, I think, from a lot of quants, system traders, is is you want to see as many regimes as possible, right? You want to see as much historical market context that you can get your hands on that's accurate. <laughs> that way you can see how, you know, a particular strategy performed during that uh, period of time. So, yeah, I think this is really cool. Um, so now there's, there's a few more things that we can actually talk about, I think, and... One of the things is if you just look at um, the code and think about the strategy. And one of the things that I always recommend is not just looking at uh, the numbers, but also thinking about whether this all makes sense. And one of the things um, that I want to point out here is diversification. And when you think of a 60-40 portfolio, then you have a, um, a defined um uh, diversification between stocks and bonds. You have 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds. And a strategy like this is different here. So um, the important thing to notice here is we picked the top three. So it's very well possible that we have everything in uh, equities. Oh, by the way, we missed, somehow we missed one ETF here. I don't know what happened here. Uh, so let's add this one. International. Yeah, well, we, we can run it again and we will see it. It, it doesn't substantially change things. Uh, it, it should be pretty close. It should be pretty close. It's not going to make night and day difference. 
maybe it did a little better here. I think it cleaned that up a little bit, but nothing, nothing big. But the point that I'm trying to make is it is well, very well possible that you have 100% in equities or 100% in hard assets. The only thing that the strategy cannot do is have 100% in fixed income. So therefore, um, when the equities market suddenly, suddenly collapse, then the strategy might be vulnerable or more vulnerable than you think. This is to some degree what we see there in, the, in these fast drawdowns um, that the strategy is not able to get out and is less diversified than one might think or might assume, right? And so that's this, very likely what happened in the 2020 kind of very quick COVID that's what happens here that it just takes this basically the same head yep. but uh, it was to some degree actually even more obvious um uh here when you when you look at what's happening here that it's really following the market it's, it, and it can't get out and it's actually taking the harder hit so this is basically something that other strategies might be able to conquer better and now one of the questions of course that arises is does this get better if we trade more often. So we could, for example, um, change this line here. And um, oops, I uh, don't want to do that. Um, let's do it like uh, this and say, hey, I have more time on my hands. Uh, could I um, do this weekly? And um, see if that makes any difference. Now it would trade on Fridays. And one of the things that you will find is, well, again, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Maybe some, but um, now why does the strategy have difficulties picking assets is, is another question that might be interesting. and. Um, this is where Turing Trader starts to help you really during development. So one of the things that you probably want to know is how momentum looks like. And um, so this is where we can create a new chart and we can have a look at um, uh, the individual momentum here. And so let's see. this uh, and let's uh, now we create another chart that actually charts the momentum of the assets and that might be something that is very helpful <clears throat> in figuring out what possible issues with the strategy are and here you see in new tab no momentum and here we can see what's happening. And this is something that is very useful and uh, to do uh, and surprisingly hard to do with other backtesting engines. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this wasn't helpful there, so we can have slightly nicer description. So let's do this. Um, Yeah. And what, I mean, this will be really helpful. I mean, when you're trying to understand, you're kind of getting inside the the actual calculations, right? So you're seeing essentially what the strategy is, is able to pick from, right? So you're getting a, a good glimpse now of, is everything moving down together? Is it going up? Is things deviating? And so, yeah, it's a busy chart, but it's a helpful one. It's a busy chart, and but it's very, very helpful. So the most important thing to notice here and this is actually what distinguishes uh, momentum strategies from each other is how noisy this is. And when you when you look into this area, for example, then you see that the, basically the momentum is going up and down every single day and by quite a lot, and they're all overlapping. There's no clear winner. So when you're in this area, then basically you don't know what the strategy is going to pick. It's going to be basically random. It's driven by all the noise. So the problem with this is really that uh, the momentum is so noisy, which 
in times where things are less clear, the strategy will have a hard time picking the best asset. Hmm. Now, do you think, do you think having any type of, uh, again, now we start to get more complex, but do you think if, if, if there's too tight of a race, right? If, if there's six assets that were, are, that are within a half a standard deviation from one another and it's time to pick a new asset, like, you know, that's kind of what you're alluding to, right? Where it's like, you're just, you're literally just a random, I mean, not a coin flip here, but there's not enough signal yes. between the yes. messiness, right? Yes. So, so this is what this type of strategy is typically struggles with. And this is uh, where actually all the work goes when you're trying to develop a better strategy. How do you clean this up? How do you make uh, these decision points better? And how do you remove all this noise? Yeah, very cool. And this is really, I think, something that is incredibly useful that you're able to look inside the internal values and see how is the strategy making these decisions. And that is something that I really recommend to anybody coding strategies like this. 100%. Yeah, I totally agree. I think having the, I mean, I'm just going to call it common sense, but I mean, it's having the trading, it's having the trading knowledge, right? I mean, if you're just approaching this, I'll, I'll say academically, right? Or if you're just looking at the numbers, but you're lost on what's, what's the drivers, where are the bottlenecks, like getting underneath the hood to actually understand how the system's operating, the environments that it's operating in, seeing the noisiness of some of these selection processes and rebalance periods, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, that's the art form in some sense of a quantitative still investing in, and it, in, it can be a hundred percent rules-based, but there's still an artist, uh, you know, uh, view of it in my opinion. And yeah, you're starting to see some of it here. All right. So do we have any questions for the code? Did we receive any questions at all? I think you scared everybody um, or everybody's tuned out now and they're all watching the Fed on what, what whatever the heck number uh, raise rate we did. But um, no, it's been a very quiet chat, but uh, there's certainly been uh, a good amount of people kind of just tuning in and watching here. I thought this was super helpful um, and we covered a lot. I mean, there's a lot here. You went through that super fast. I mean, that was like chat GPT-4 kind of coding up a new trading system for us. So um yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the other question I have in my head, you sort of alluded to it is just you've got you've got these nine assets, right? Or two, five, yeah, nine assets. I mean, it's it's thinking about that universe too, right? Like you said, it's it's being in all equities and and having some constraints there potentially in terms of diversification, but also you can slice and dice this with lots of different things. And so you've got a lot of levers to pull here and to work on. <laughs> um, and yeah, it would definitely, you know, it's intriguing. I mean, the, the core of the strategy though, makes sense. Um, I guess, you know, yeah, I guess the only thing I, I well, let's, let's see here. Let's just think this out real quick. I mean, Gary Antonassi's dual momentum is, is the only difference here basically is that like Gary's strategy, popularized strategy could just pick nothing right it could just okay, sure. so, cash well then, then let's let's do this and uh, let's turn this into something close to dual momentum how would one do this and uh, it's actually surprisingly easy so what we could do here is we could put another filter in here and we could say hey we look at this momentum the same momentum and require it to be uh, larger than zero and now this is dual momentum. So one more line of code. And let's see what this does. Mm. And it's, it's less impressive than one would think. Doesn't add a whole lot, maybe a little smoother of an equity curve, but it still experiences yeah, a good I'm amount sure. of drawdowns. I'm sure. I think, I think it actually did some did lose something here definitely in 2008 it lost some of its its edge but it yeah in 2015 it didn't really do a whole lot either yeah so i i, I don't think it, it makes a whole lot of difference but the important part is really 
once you have a little bit of code, it's easy to play around with it and see if there's other things that you can do and other things that you can play around with. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, I thought this was great. I learned a couple of things and uh, it's pretty crazy that this is what, 50, 60 lines of code, 50 lines of code all, all, all in uh, Something like that. Yeah. All, think- all, yeah. Yeah, but honestly, if, if, if you're going to punish me for the lines of code, then well, we'll press this magic button so this save us two lines, and well, we can make the lines a little longer. So we could save on lines. <laughs> uh, making me and, uh, relive some of my computer science undergrad and a lot of, days. A lot of this stuff is optional, right? So Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought this was great. I thought this was a, a very cool example here. Um, showcase just a lot of different elements. Uh, so do we, do we have people online to, uh, can we get any comment on what other type of strategy we would want to look at. Yeah, that's definitely what I will uh, pose. So there's going to be a lot of people that'll more people that are going to listen to this after the fact. So what I'll say is, you know, if you're listening to this after the fact, um, I mean, we covered a lot here. So definitely, you know, rewind, look through everything, put the, put the speed on 0.75 because Felix typed fast and went through a lot of stuff. But let us know if you like this. Do you want to see more of these? Do you want to see us look at some other strategies, look at some other code? Do you find this helpful? Um, and if you have other direction thoughts that you're trying to, um, you know, you, you just want to see explored, leave a comment because that's what's going to help us dictate where we go from here, um, let's call it. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think that was, I mean, I think that was a pretty good review um, from code to, uh, from, you know, str- starting nothing to uh, full implementation and, and reviewing a strategy. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, yes, I, I, I think I think we made some progress here. So hopefully this is helpful for anybody who wants to get into coding these strategies and um, to have something to go off uh, and to have some examples, I think always helps. And some people are more of the visual kind than uh, of the reading kind. So. Um, I, I hope this is helpful. And uh, there, there's a bunch more that we could do. So we could look into some uh, strategies that actually trade stocks because that poses some unique questions about how to deal with a universe like the S&P 500 or something like that. So I maybe that's something that we want to look into. Yeah, totally agree. So, all right, folks, uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, TuringTrader.com, that's where you can find Felix. You can find a lot more portfolios uh, just like this and some a little more advanced and a little more complex, dare I say. And so you can check out TuringTrader.com. We're going to be doing some more live streams ourselves. You can find some of Turing Trader's portfolios on Trade Risk's website. And uh, again, leave some comments below. Let us know what you're interested in. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be back in about a month or so, maybe with something new, different lesson, different strategy for uh, for all you folks. So that's all I got. Felix, thanks for taking the time today and I uh, hope to see you back here soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Take care.